Um, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, I uh, have a good news story for you. This is Brother Sam. Hello, Sam. A recent reconvert to Christianity. Yeah. Uh, and an ex Muslim. Ah, okay. Um, now, some of you may remember Sam, and hopefully JC will do a flashback. Yeah. When uh, me and Hamza had a bit of a clash here in the park, um, and, and it was sort of like put on film, and, and me and Hamza had a bit of an argy bargy. Some of you might remember that Sam was the guy that came and confronted me and came and challenged me ah. and said, you know, I have, I have got family who are Christians and they'd be ashamed of you. And then I called him a wussy Christian because I was a Christian. <laughs> yeah. Five, so, my grandparents are both pastors, part-time pastors, admittedly. And they do do things like what you're doing, speaking to people like Darren. They'd be embarrassed by the way you two are acting. Absolutely. And shame on the pair of you, Absolutely. honestly. Sorry, I had to Look, say Sideboy here is here to talk about about weak man's Christianity. Yeah, yeah. You go and preach it, brother. <laughs> preach it somewhere else. else. And then it turned out yeah, that yeah. actually he was a Muslim who was meeting Hamza to do some camera work. That's probably my most famous moment in speaking school. Yeah. <laughs> so so um, we're going to get his testimony later. I like. But I, I just want to do a talk yeah, yeah. about because we've got here an ex Muslim. You're a Muslim for about two and a half years? Two and a half years. And so I want to talk about. Um, the, the, the talk about Christian and Islamic spirituality and draw some out because we have someone who spent two and a half years amongst Muslims. Okay. He used to go to the mosque in Wales. So he and and so we're going to do some comparisons between Islamic spirituality and Christian spirituality from someone who's got first-hand experience of Islamic ex, uh, spirituality. Okay. Now we're not we're not holding Sam to be an expert. He's not claiming to be an expert. Right. He's just claiming to be an ex-Muslim. Okay. Okay. One of many. There are many, many ex-Muslims. You see them all the time at the park. They're often challenging the Dawah team. So I really don't understand why Muslims have a problem believing that there are Muslims who are leaving Islam. It happens all the time. There are entire networks of ex-Muslims and many of them become Christians like Christopher the Kurd, the, the Kurdish brother from last time. We've had Christian sisters come down here. There's there's Christian evangelists here in the park who are ex-Muslims. So, on that, Sam, um, I want to just start off by telling me three good things because we're often we're often accused of being Islamophobic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like we don't see anything good in Islam. Yeah. yeah. So I, I want to make my first question yeah. about Islam, about the positives. So Sam, tell us three good things in terms of Islamic spirituality that you learned um, during your time as a Muslim. I would say first disclaimer though, so most of these things I'm going to mention, I believe that most people would have these in their moral compass anyway, but they're certainly reinforced and they're heavily doctrined, if that makes any sense to yeah. you. One would be caring and respecting your parents even in old age. There is a, there's an Islamic idea that regardless you, of your thoughts on your parents, you should always look after them even in their old age and in their ailments. Yeah. Uh, and there is a heavy stress put on that. It can be a clean, in terms of spirituality, it can be a clean life, i.e. Like, no alcohol, you know, and uh, there is an idea of sexual morality, and that is obviously heavily put on you. And that's obviously a, not a bad thing to learn. That can give you some very good morals. And in fact, actually, when I was a Muslim, I didn't really miss alcohol that much, fair I have to be fair. Yep. And it can also teach you how to live a very disciplined life, because you have to structure your life around the prayers, for example. So yeah, you have, to, you have to plan everything in your life, and it can teach you the value of discipline, like spiritual discipline, yep. because it is a heavy practice. Those would say be the three main things that I would say I can think of. But, okay. But yeah, I would say, in, in my personal opinion, lots of people would have some of this in their moral compass already. Oh, yeah. That's my and, and 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 as Christians, the first thing that he mentioned was to respect and look after your parents, and that there's a lot of emphasis put on that. And and the truth is, we have this in the Christian faith. One of the actual commandments of God is to honour your mother and father. What has happened in the West? is that we don't value Christian teaching anymore, and so we don't value the principle of honoring your mother and father. But I know lots of Christians who've gone to great personal expense and great personal sacrifice to look after their parents. In the scriptures, the, the teachings of the apostles are that those that don't take care of their parents are worse than pagans. Wow. That is what the scriptures teach. 
So we, we uh, whilst I acknowledge that there is this nobility within the Islamic community, it's nothing that we didn't have before Islam. The other thing that Sam mentioned was this idea of the idea of, uh, it can be a clean life, the idea of sexual purity, the idea of, uh, you know, not having sex outside of marriage, not drinking alcohol. Well, the scriptures teach that strong wine makes a fool of men and that we should be sober-minded, that we shouldn't give ourselves over to alcoholism. Christians are permitted to drink, that's undeniable. No one's going to pretend otherwise. But the idea of becoming drunk like the Western English do is foreign to the church. It's foreign. It is, it is a small amount of alcohol, occasionally, maybe at some kind of celebration, within a, a context of family and friends, so your behaviour is moderated by the expectations of community. And every Christian knows that in our churches, we'll drink. But you won't go to many church affairs and find people getting drunk. <laughs> Do you know why? Because that is not our attitude. We're not English. The English have this nihilistic attitude of going out and getting wasted on a Friday and a Saturday night because their lives are empty and meaningless and that's all they think about. That's all they think is important. It gives meaning to their lives. It's, the, it's a cry of emptiness that Christianity can fulfill. And Christianity teaches there should be no sex outside of marriage. It teaches that the, the marriage bed is sacred. It teaches that, that even to look at a woman with lust in your eyes is to commit adultery with her. So the, the standard of Christian teaching is comparable to what we see in Islam. We don't need Islam for this. And the third positive thing that Sam said about Islam was that it gives us structure in our day. Structure in our day about building our lives around prayer. Well, how many times have you heard me talking about the seven disciplines of the Christian faith? And the first of them is prayer. The idea of having a regular rhythm of prayer in your day. It's absolutely essential that Christians pray regularly and structure prayer into their lives. But one of the differences between Islam and Christianity is that a Christian must work out their salvation with fear and trembling. And so a regular rhythm of prayer in my life may look different to a regular rhythm of prayer in Sam's life. Because the circumstances might be different. I mean, how can an Eskimo follow Muhammad when he lives in a land where the sun rises only and sets only twice a year? When the idea of Salat is built around the movement of the sun. How can you do that when the sun spends six months under the horizon? You can't. Circumstances are different and so the practices have to be different. Christians have learned do not need Islam for anything. And the good things that Islam can bring to the West, Christianity already provides it. All that Westerners need to do is to tap into their Christian heritage and claim it for themselves. Now, tell us three bad things that you learn in the mosque. I've also got some references here just so no one can accuse me of uh, not knowing my stuff. So the treat treatment of women is for one, of how uh, they're allowed to be beaten by their husbands, which you find in uh, Surah 4, 24. To hate the unbelievers, now this is a, this was a hard one to swallow actually, you, have, you are forced to hate all the unbelievers, even your own family. When it regards to the family, there's a slight twist on it that you should still respect them and you should always sort of still treat them with good credence, but you don't necessarily love them in your heart. And that one, for example, would be 66.10 and 48.30. 48, and then obviously the law of apostasy, which I'm kind of now applicable to, uh, because at the end of the day, everyone has the right, because God has given us all free will, as I, as I see it, to do as, they, to do as they wish with their own faiths. So if someone chooses to leave a faith, that's their right. And obviously you find this in Bukhari and obviously in the Quran as well. In the Quran it's in 489 and in Bukhari it's 55 to 60. Okay, so I want you, all you liberal do-gooders that may come across this video to realise that there are Muslims in the park that will defend the idea of killing apostates. That means that there are Muslims in the park that would defend the idea of killing Sam because he left Islam. Let that sit on your conscience for a second 
the next time that you try to teach that all religions are the same. Because I have my New Testament with me and I challenge anyone to find in the New Testament a command to kill apostates. There is no such command. The idea of hating the unbeliever is something that you were taught in the mosque. Yes. The idea that you couldn't love those who didn't worship Allah. And we've heard other Muslims in the park talk about hating for the cause of Allah. We, we, we know that they say that. Well, hold on one second. Jesus said you shall know them by their fruits and by their fruits you shall know them. If your religion is cultivating hatred and bitterness towards others and you embrace that teaching of your religion, then that means that you are embracing hatred and bitterness towards others. It becomes who you are. By contrast, what did our Lord say? He said, love your enemies and do good to those that curse you. The contrast could not be more stark between the teachings of Muhammad and the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. They are completely different philosophies, completely different moral structures. The contrast is between black and white. They are not the same religion, they don't teach the same, they don't believe in the same God and their prophets didn't bring the same message. One of the other things that you mentioned, sorry, one of the first things that you mentioned in the, oh, the treatment of women. In the Quran it says that if your wife is disobedient, first admonish her, then banish her from the bed, and then if she continues, beat her. Beat her. Now, the apologists here in the park will say this, that when it talks about beating, it talks about a symbolic beating with a tiny little stick. It's like doing this. <laughs> That's what they're talking about, right? Firstly, beating women in any sense is wrong. It doesn't matter whether you're doing it with a little stick or doing it with your fist. If your religion is teaching that it is permissible to beat women in any regard, your religion needs to change. Because women are made with the same dignity, the same imatio deo, the same image of God that any man is made of. And where's the Quranic instruction for the woman to beat the man? Why is it only one way? After all, I thought they were meant to be equal. There is no such teaching in the New Testament about beating women. By contrast, the apostles say that we Christians must love our wives as Christ loved the church. Christ gave his life for the church. We must give our lives for our wives. It teaches that we must honor and dignify one another and serve one another. That's the economy of the Christian family, not the idea that the man gets to beat women. And think about the logic of it. The Quran says first admonish them, and then it says banish them from the bed. So that's an escalation. It's you, you tell them off, and then you kick them out of the bed, just, just for you all you Arab girls out there. We Christian men, when we fall out with our wives, because of our chivalry, it's the man that leaves the bed and sleeps on the settee, not the woman. <laughs> because in our faith, we have this concept of chivalry, this idea of the Christian knight. So even if the woman was in the wrong and you couldn't sleep in the same bed, the man would sleep on the settee, not the woman. Now, the escalation is admonish them, banish them from the bed, and then it says beat them. Now logically, why would you suddenly go admonish them, banish from the, from the bed, and then symbolically beat them? It doesn't go with the flow of the text. The text is talking about an increase in punishment. There are hadiths where Aisha says that she has not seen any women amongst any people that are as badly treated as the women of the Ummah. And she uses examples of women that are bruised, deeply bruised. Green because of the treatment of Muslim men. But a Christian man must love and honor his wife. He must love them and serve them like Christ loves the church. This contrast is clear, make your choice. Now, the third thing, the third thing is we've, we've asked for the good, the bad and the ugly. And the thing that we're defining as the ugly 
is the idea of, of silly superstitions. So do you want to give your, your yep. example? So the first one is obviously Muslims before they pray perform the wudu, the ceremonial washing. Now majority of people I used to do this, once you've done it you just dry yourself off. But in Sahih Muslim 244, there is a hadith that says that you, you just let yourself drip dry, essentially. And every drop of water that drops off you is a sin of some description. Speak to the camera, bro. Uh, so, yeah, and uh, yeah, that, that just seems a bit silly. Then there's another one is saying, SubhanAllah, a hundred times removes... At first, I thought it was a certain number of sins, but I looked it up last night, and it's all your sins. If you say SubhanAllah a hundred times, it removes all your sins. That's from Bakari, uh, 6405. And then finally, I thought, I go with kissing the black stone. Just because in the, in Bakari in 597, oh, yep, 597, the companions of Muhammad only did this because they saw him do it. And not for any other reason. Why is that? Right. So, to be clear, to be clear, there are many there are many examples of the accretions of superstition within the Christian Church. I know of Christians who think that because they've got a statue of a certain saint, that that means that they their driving is protected. Uh, the camera, JC. The camera, JC. There you go. So, so that there's this this yeah, yeah, he's going to edit that bit out. Yeah. So, so the fact of the matter is, there are examples of silly superstitions within the Christian community. You go to churches and you see people like rubbing the toe of Saint Peter. You see all these brass statues where it's all darkened because of oxidization, but the toe is shiny and buff because people touch it, as if somehow it brings them luck. So there are superstitions within the Christian faith as well. I'm not saying that we're free of superstition. But show me them in the New Testament. Show me them rooted in what Jesus did. Show me them in Jesus' teaching. There's no such superstitions within the Christian faith. Shall we just move back a bit? Shall we just move back a bit? Right. So, right. Let, let, let. Yeah, and then they get into an argument. So, there are superstitions within the Christian faith, but they can't be rooted in Jesus' teaching. But Muslims literally kiss a rock for no reason except Muhammad did it. There are other hadiths, if I'm, aware, if, if I'm correct, where Muslims believe that the, the rock is black because it has absorbed the sins yeah. of Muslims. Really? Really? <laughs> well, in the hadith I, that I quoted, I can't quote it exactly, forgive me for any Muslims watching, but the companion of, uh, of uh, Muhammad said, in his own words, I only kiss you because I saw the Prophet do it. Yeah. I only kiss you because I saw the Prophet do it. It's a noisy place, Speaker's Corner. So, anyway, as Christians, we believe, we believe that salvation, we believe that salvation is a gift of God. It is something that God does for us through his grace. The idea that you can say God's name and this wipes away your sins. Why a hundred times? Why not 99 times? JC, take the conversation elsewhere. Why, why, why not 99 times? Why not 101 times? It's a ridiculous superstition made for a God who resembles a fetishist. <laughs> You've got to say Subhadala a hundred times. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Yeah, you got to say it a hundred times. But why not 98 or 97 yeah. or 99? I believe that these superstitions are there because the salvation within Islam is like a weighing scales. And all your sins and bad deeds are weighed against each other. Well, anything that can tip those scales in your favor, you're going to do it. Yeah. But the, the, the difference is that the, the Christian faith teaches that salvation is God's gift to you. No, no I agree. I was just yeah, yeah, no, I know you are. I know you are. <laughs> so it's the idea that, that God, to use an analogy, we have all failed to meet the glory of God. And so we're all in his debt because of the difference of where we need to be and where we are. 
And so what happens is that debt is paid by God himself. It's like everyone, everyone has a check in their back pocket that pays off the debt. The Christians are the ones who cash the check. Christ died so that everyone would be saved. That means every single person has that check in their back pocket, but they haven't cashed it. The Christians are the ones that have cashed it. And so you've got to ask yourself, do you want to believe in a, in a fickle God where if you don't do enough good works, the scales might not be built in your favor? Or do you want to appeal to the pure mercy of God? The pure mercy of God that wipes away all your sins because, what, because of what God has done. And also, if you have to do all these things to get rid of your sin, then this is a salvation of justice. It's based upon your works. But what happens if your works aren't enough? What happens if your works aren't sufficient? The reality is that if God is a God of justice in Islam, he's not a God of mercy. Mercy is that you forgive people unmeritously. They haven't earned it. They haven't done enough. But if Allah is merciful, where is his justice? In the cross, the Christians believe that both things have been met together in the cross. Justice and mercy together. And that a man's sins are wiped away by the work of God. The choice is yours. A religion of superstition or a religion of theology. A God who is a fetishist or a God of justice and mercy. Okay, brilliant. So, Sam, do you want to just tell us, we're going to go on to a, another talk now, we're going to just get Sam's testimony. Do you want to do it somewhere yeah, else I, or do it here? Can I, can I ask a question on the first talk? Yeah, yeah go on. Am I editing? Oh. Looking back now, Sam, are you able to recognise certain tactics now that you left Islam that they sort of used in you at the beginning to get your conversion? So I guess um, if you're on about the YouTube channels, I guess I never watched a video when I first looked into Islam. Yeah, talk say to when, me. say when this man was being questioned, or say Hatun, or or uh, what's the other guy, Godwin. You know, like they were always uh, the weaker Christians, the ones who didn't know how to defend the faith. I'm not going to pretend I can that right now, by the way. But certainly, they can misrepresent what Christians believe and what Christians think. So, so, for example, the Trinity, they try to make it as three literal gods. That's not the case. It's one God and three persons. You know, and like, uh, but you, in some of these videos, you would see the Christians walking away thinking, oh, that person was right. Whereas really, they had their faith twisted right. and misconstrued. Okay. okay. Any other questions? I think that's about it, yes. Okay. Are, are, is the microphone good with the background noises yeah, yeah, to do the testimony? Yeah, this goes straight to Okay, so we're, we're going to do your testimony now. 